start on this particular parable is in Mark chapter 4. If you want to turn there, Mark chapter 4, we'll read 20 verses, kind of a, a, a long set of verses, and then we'll kind of just open this parable up. It's going to be about the parable of the sower, which is a, a pretty uh, common parable if you've read through the Gospels. It's in all three. It's in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and uh, just a real powerful uh, parable here. We'll read the 20 verses and then we'll pray and just kind of open this up a bit. Verse 1 says, And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. The fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up, and increased and brought forth thirty, sixty, and a hundred. And he said unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they asked, were about him with the twelve, asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may see, and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know you not this parable? How then will you know all parables? The sower sows the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground. And when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred. Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you that we can trust in uh, inspired scripture that we can trust in, in your knowledge and your wisdom to direct us, to teach us, to guide us in this world. I pray that you'd open our hearts to your truth, allow us to see this parable in a fresh, new way, in a way that uh, brings knowledge to our hearts and impacts our daily living and brings glory and honor to you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So this particular parable is probably one of the most familiar parables that you hear a lot of, uh, of people talk about. I, I might add that this is probably one of the, the, the health, wealth, prosperity gospel preachers love to use this parable, uh, especially verse 20, about uh, that God will bring forth a, 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 a fruitful um, harvest in your life. He'll bring 30 fold or 60 fold or 100 fold and I don't know if you've ever seen it the TBM preachers are like you know you need to sow into our ministry you need to give all your money into our ministry and God will just produce this great amount of blessing in your life well this parable has nothing to do with financial freedom it has nothing to do with God bringing finances to anyone's bank account uh, this is all spiritual and this is all about the soil. It's all about the responses that people have towards the gospel being preached. And when you read this particular parable and, and, and the other two gospels, there's a little bit added in each one of the gospels, especially when it comes down to the particular parts of the soil. But when you come down to verse 20 and it says, 
And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, some re and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. What's real interesting about this is um, that this particular culture, which was a, an agreement, it, it just was a culture that was so enamored with this, this harvesting, this sowing, this reaping, this farming culture, that this on any day would be a great harvest. If you got 30% back, that was you were doing great in this culture. If you got 60 to 100, if you got 100% of the seeds that you put in the ground, you put, say, 5,000 seeds in the ground and you got 5,000 crops back from 5,000 seeds, that's a miracle by itself. That's a one-to-one -one return on every single crop. And the same thing with 60. I mean, that's a 60% return. And so when you study kind of this culture and, and, and that they were such farmers and to know that this 30, 60, 100 is something beyond they've ever really normally experienced when they're doing farming, you have to imagine the amount of people that are sitting here listening to this parable. Thousands upon thousands of people before Jesus actually interprets it to the disciples. Because you remember down there in the middle part of the parable, the disciples come to him kind of alone and say, Hey, what in the world did you just say? They want him to communicate it. But before then, we're still kind of in this general uh, proclamation, this open air preaching that Jesus is doing to thousands of people. And he's doing it to thousands of people who are predominantly farmers and understand that especially in Galilee where this is being preached, there was nothing but fields and farms for as, as far as the eye can see. So this is a real familiar context for the people in that land to understand what Jesus is doing and once again we remember what a parable is we talked about when we first started and, and Jesus is taking a spiritual truth and he's throwing it out there alongside of stuff that they are familiar with day by day and so that was just a beautiful way that Jesus taught but if you really look at this parable it, it almost looks like the sower is really unsuccessful except for the last soil because he throws the seed in three soils, three different places that the seed drops. The seed doesn't do anything. It either immediately dies, or the birds come and grab it, or it takes a little bit of a root, but it, it runs into a, a, a rocky surface underneath the surface of the soil. But, I mean, really, to be honest with you, if you're really trying to calculate... Uh, the skill and tact of the sower in this parable, by all means, he was unsuccessful. Because three different places, the seed doesn't take root. It's only that one last place where the seed falls on good ground, takes root, and then it does produce a crop that's 30, 60, or 100. Um, when you look at this parable, what you're really looking at is the sower is not Christ. The sower is any Christian who proclaims the gospel. It's any pastor who proclaims the gospel. This parable is talking about a seed. The seed is the Word of God. The sower is the person who throws the seed. And God is the only one that can bring the, um, the return on the seed. So uh, the sower is any Christian who proclaims the Word of God. It can be you. This is in a setting of a church, the setting of a pulpit. This is the setting of a direct conversation that a Christian would have with an unbeliever. He would be sowing the Word into the heart of that uh, unbeliever, and it would be up to the, the soil, the, the preparation of the soil to receive the Word. What's real interesting here is not one place in this parable does it talk about the skill, the craft, the knack, the oration skills of the sower? Not one place. Because the whole parable is not designed to bring emphasis on the sower and his skill or his craft or his ability to proclaim or preach the word. It's all about the soil. The seed is perfect. The seed's the word of God. So the quality of what the sower is proclaiming, it is perfect in every respect. 
And God uses imperfect sowers to sow His perfect Word in a dead, sinful heart. And that is the whole uh, point of the whole parable is that it's about different soils. It's about different hearts. Some are non-productive and some are very productive. Let me take it a step further because I think most people when they preach this text, they really miss the boat here. And that is that this parable is really about effective evangelism. It's about the, per the perception that someone who is evangelizing needs to have when he's talking to a lost person. And, and that is that when you evangelize, when you uh, give a witness to an unbeliever and give them the Word of God, or you uh, uh, testify to them, or, or you evangelize them, or you witness to them, whatever way you want to put it, uh, there's some certain things that, that we have to understand as a church and as believers. And one of those things is that we are not responsible for the response of the unbeliever. And that takes all the pressure off. Let me tell you something. If I, if I felt in my heart of hearts that I was responsible for the way people respond to the gospel every time I preach, I would be a wreck. I'd be in a loony bin. Because I understand the gravity of if people do not accept Christ as Savior and Lord, where they're heading, what direction they're going. They're going in the opposite direction. So uh, one of the reasons why I never feel a huge burden about if people respond, my responsibility is to be able to present the Word of God clearly. And once I've done that, I've done my job. And that's one of the reasons why, and I know I beat on this all the time, and I'm going to keep beating on it. That's one of the reasons why I am not so fond of the altar calls. I'm not fond of those systems because those systems, uh, what happens in a church, especially a church that, that doesn't do altar calls, people begin to feel like the church is not productive in the hearts of the people who are hearing the gospel because we don't get someone who stands up and raises their hand or says a sinner's prayer or walks down to the altar. And then what happens is the church begins to create this strategy to try to get people to respond the way they want them to respond. And if they don't do that, guess what they start doing? They start manipulating the way the words preach. They take hell out. They take sin out. They start using other verbiage. They start adapting the word uh, to people's emotions. And, and, and the church exists for one reason and one reason only. And that's the purpose of evangelism. That's the only reason why God has even left us on this earth. Nothing else. That is the main priority. It was the Great Commission before Jesus left. His last words to his disciples. You need to go into the world. You need to make disciples. You need to teach them everything I've taught you. You need to baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You need to get them into believer's baptism. That's what you are to do. That's the Great Commission. That's what the church is here for. And that's kind of what this parable explains. It explains the different responses that people have towards the Word when it's presented. And for many Christians, this effort seems discouraging. It seems daunting at times. Uh, it, it just it seems disappointing. I mean, I don't know how many people that you've ever witnessed to that you seem like maybe you know, one in every 50 might respond. And we might not even get that. You know, whatever it is, how many ever people, you could think back in your mind how many people you have witnessed over your lifetime and just think about, well, you know, I didn't get a big response. When I gave them the gospel, I felt like I did it in a clear fashion, in a great fashion. I felt like I was inspired by the Spirit of God to do it. I felt like this was the moment to give them the Word of God. And they just listened to me in a, a gentle, polite way, and they just went off and walked about their business. So how come no response, right? That, you know, is there a problem with me? Is there a problem with what I taught them? Is there a problem with the way I, you know, how I communicated it? Maybe I was standing at the wrong angle. Maybe my hair wasn't just, you know, that's what churches start thinking about when they don't have the mass altar calls. So when you have a small church like this, or even Lanark, and, and, and when we preach the gospel in there, and we're not saying, hey, run down to the altar, or come and grab hold of the altar and, and get saved. 
you know, sometimes if you don't have the correct vision and focus on what Scripture talks about, that the pastor, that the church is not responsible for the response of the sinner, if you don't have that view in mind, you will get discouraged. Because you're like, well, no one's getting saved here. No one's coming down to the altar. No one's making a visible appearance of a profession of faith. And what happens is, is when churches take that, that path and they say, you know what? This good old-fashioned way of preaching the gospel that has been good for so many years, it is now no longer in this culture making people respond to that. It's just not happening anymore. So you know what the churches do? They change their way of presenting the Bible. They change their way... They adapt the message of the gospel because all they're getting back is people just rejecting it or just sitting there in a nonchalant way and not really, you know, coming forward and, and being saved. And so what happens is you have churches that can either say, God is holy, God is in control, God is the one that plows the heart. God is the one that awakens people to new life. The Spirit of God is the one that convicts. The Spirit of God is the one that plants the Word in the heart. The pastor is just responsible for throwing the seed. And what happens is, is churches kind of get caught in this, and they start putting coffee shops in the churches, and they start doing entertainment in the churches, and they say, I'm not against those things, but when you start doing those things to get a response from the gospel, you've just changed the message. Because the gospel can't be adapted, it can't be changed. And I, I think there's a lot of people that do that, and I think that the reason why they do it is because they think they're in control of people responding to the gospel. And that's not what we're called to do. As a matter of fact, there's a, a passage, and you don't have to go to it, you can write it down. But 2 Timothy chapter 4, I mentioned it Sunday, and I just mentioned it in passing, but this is so important here. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, you know, this is Paul's young protege here. Um, actually, this is the last chapter that Paul would pen. Um, before he is killed, before he's martyred. So this is like the last, this is his last stretch running, running the race. This is it. The, the chapter 4, 2 Timothy, is Paul handing the baton to young Timothy, and these are his final words. And verse 1 says, I charge thee, that's a military term in the Greek that he's, that he's giving to uh, 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 Timothy. There before God... And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Right there. That is, that is a military charge that Paul is giving to Timothy. And you know what he's doing? Paul is doing it in the sight of God the Father and God the Son. He's writing this letter specifically to Timothy. And he's telling Timothy, I am your commander. You are my young protege. And before I die, I charge you. And I'm going to do it in the presence of God and the Son so you know how serious this really is. Well, what's so serious, Paul? Verse 2, preach the Word. Well, how long do I need to do that for, Paul? You need to be instant, in season, and out of season. Reprove, rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to faith. The interesting part here is, is Paul is instruct. You would think that if if a, a if an older pastor in the Lord was passing the baton to his young protege, there would be words of encouragement. These words are Paul telling Timothy, guess what? You're going to preach your little heart out, and they're going to depart from the truth. But what I want you to understand is you keep preaching. Watch this. No matter what the response is. That's what he's saying right there. That's why he says in verse 2, you need to be instant what? In season and what? Out of season. Guess what? You can't catch fish year round. You can't do it. 
There's going to be seasons when you're out there fishing where you're going to catch a whole load of them. There'll be years in ministry where it seems like every time you witness to someone, they receive it, they get it, they come to church, and you see their life blossom and flourish. And there's going to be other years where it just seems like you keep giving the gospel out, you keep witnessing, you keep talking to people about the Lord, and they just don't want to hear it. And Paul is telling Timothy, no matter what, no matter if you're catching fish or you're not catching fish, you keep throwing the hook out there. You keep throwing the line in the water because guess what? God is the one that directs the fish to the hook. God is the one that prepares them to chomp down on it. God is the one that ultimately does the catching. And so this is one of the passages that has always kept me stable has always kept me true in preaching, has always kept me with, with a heart that understands that no matter what my effort and my energy displays in the church, whatever the passion is, my sole responsibility is to preach this as clear as I can, make sure I pray as much as I can, and make sure that the people that are listening to it understand exactly what it says. That's all my responsibility is. I'm not the one that can prepare the heart. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy. There's going to be a time when preaching is out of season. Not out of season in heaven, but out of season on this world. Because people's hearts are already hardened towards the gospel. And so the issue here is the soil again. This is almost a parable of the soil. That is the issue. The issue is that there's going to be times where people do not want to hear about the gospel. They don't want to hear about the Bible. They, they, they've gone their own way. They've, they've found teachers that have modified the scripture. The issue here in this parable is the human heart. So let, let me just kind of go down these different soils. It's kind of self-explanatory, but verse 4, we'll just kind of call this the roadside soil. Um, well, what it's given a picture of is robes. Just like any farmer would do, and just like if you're just, you know, passing through some of our farmlands, like if you're going to Georgia or wherever you're going, and you see these massive amounts of, of acreage and these, uh, there's just going to be row after row after row after row of where they're harvesting. And then there's going to be places on the left hand and the right hand side where areas haven't been plowed. And in here, because the terrain was so rocky, and they had a lot of bedrock and limestone and those other things in this area, uh, the farmers couldn't literally just plow 50 acres. Uh, they would just plow little rows, and whatever was on the sides, they would leave. And that would become like the pathways where they would walk. They didn't have tractors and John Deere's and all that stuff. So they would leave pathways to walk on in order to get to the places they had plowed. And so this is giving that vivid illustration of literally... A farmer who is literally with both hands is literally just grabbing handfuls of seed and he's walking down that beaten path and he's just throwing seed in a sporadic way and any way and guess what he's doing it's like bird shot all over the place and, and, and these seeds are falling on these different types of soils one of the things that's real interesting about this imagery is that the sower isn't so much precise with where the target he's trying to hit. He knows where what is plowed is plowed, but the seed is actually falling on other places. And sometimes I think it's, it's very important that as whoever is witnessing, or if the pastor or the preacher is, this is not just geared towards the pastor, it's geared towards anybody who's witnessing, but we mostly see this as someone preaching from the pulpit. And that is that you throw the seed wherever you can throw the seed because you just never know what heart God has already prepared before they've even heard the word. And you know what, in my, in my experience, most of the time, it's the person that you never thought that would get saved is the one who does get saved. It's not the one who looks the part and plays the part and talks the part. It's usually the one that you would just be like, oh, God can't save him. He's you know, too far. He's a misfit. He's out there in left field. And that's actually where that seed falls. And that's where it takes root. 
And so that's kind of the imagery here. And so you got that roadside soil, it's kind of unplowed, kind of that hard baked earth, if you will. The seed kind of lands on that. There's no hope for life whatsoever. Uh, it can't take root, it can't germinate, it can't spring up. And, and that's kind of where all the footpaths are on this particular uh, roadside soil, which would be verse 4. It came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And the fowls were there, just came and devoured it up. The, uh, the second type of soil, we'll just kind of call that rocky soil in verse 5. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth. This is interesting. I've heard pastors preach this a different way. I, I wish they maybe would study a little bit deeper here, but when you study this area in Galilee, especially where these parables were taught, this is not referring to that there were stones on the surface of the soil. Well, this is referring because no good, no good farmer is just going to say, hey, there's a bunch of rocks here, let me throw it right there, right? That doesn't make sense, you know what I mean? He's, he's throwing indiscriminately, but he's not going to say, oh, there's a whole bunch of rocks, let me put a whole pile there. Uh, what well, this is referring to actually in this particular part of the area, they had a real issue with limestone underneath the surface of good soil. So the sower would never even have any type of clue of the, that particular area that maybe some seed fell on had a piece of bedrock underneath it. And so on the surface, watch this, the soil looks good, but when the seed starts to try to take root, it can't because there's an obstruction there. And, and, and that'll play into when Jesus begins to interpret what's going on there. So you have this roadside soil that's all we already know is unplowed, it's hard baked earth. And then you have this rocky soil which refers to that rock bed that's kind of underneath the surface. It's covered by a shallow layer of soil. So the sower's not familiar with if that's good or not. And then verse 7 talks about we we'll just call it the weed infested soil. It's kind of wild vegetation, thorns and thistles and the whole nine. We know nothing's going to grow there. And then verse 8 is that fruitful or fertile soil. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up, increased by forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. I kind of want to go back to just something for a second once again about this. That uh, remember, nothing is said about the skill of the one who sows. And, and I want to emphasize that because I think that sometimes Christians put themselves in a position where they put themselves, uh, not at odds, but in the face of a pastor, or in the face of, you know, well, we look at some of these great pastors that are passing like John MacArthur's and David Jeremiah's and these guys, and they're like, they got mega churches with, you know, thousands and thousands of people been doing it for years and years and decades, and, you know, they, they've never been caught in a scandal or no scorn or anything. They have just done it the right way in a healthy way for a, a whole bunch of years, and then you take a, you know, a Christian that, you know, is walking the beach in Alligator Point. I mean, how in the world can he have a profound effect like these men, right? You got these great big pastors that pastor these mega churches, and then you got just a nominal Christian, a regular Christian is walking the beach, you know, on Alligator Point, and it comes in contact uh, with an unbeliever and wants to witness with them. And, and here's the great thing about the gospel. The word, the seed, is perfect. It has all the power to create saving spiritual life in it. Uh, the passage in Isaiah that says when God's word comes down, it doesn't return unto him void. There's nothing wrong with the seed. And guess what? Despite our frailties, despite our lack of education, despite our, our gifts of being able to preach in an elegant way, God still uses imperfect people to sow his perfect word. And that's a beautiful thing. You want to know why? Because I know there's times when I'm preaching and I'm stumbling and bumbling. I got this King James language all in my head and I'm trying to, you know, read this at the same time. I've got my language on paper and, you know, and, and, and it's a great thing to know that God uses, like 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, he uses clay pots. That's what we are, clay pots. There's a little powerful little verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that talks about that the gospel, the treasure of the gospel is hid in clay pots. That's who we are. We're clay pots and God has given us the gospel. He has entrusted his word to us despite our frailties, despite our sinfulness, 
despite us all having different gifts and different levels of education, God still uses us all to get his word out. And that's why this parable, there's no bearing on the skill of the sower because God is the one who does the work. It's not the sower. It's not the sower. And there's only one sower in this story. And like I said, it's the difference is in the condition of the heart. Um, we already talked about there's no, no, nothing in here about the quality of the seed because we know that verse 14 says the sower sows the what? The word. The word is the word of God. We know that that is perfect. The issue is the soil. I want to I show you something real quick. There's a, there's a real... Uh, interesting word here that I really didn't see. Um, this is actually the first time I saw it, and I've studied this parable for decades. Um, but verse 3, there's this word, hearken. You see that word, hearken? It's the Greek word. It's the Greek word, akuo. And what's really important about this word, and I've never seen this word, most of the time when Jesus uses the word hearken, He's just saying, hey, listen. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to give you some information. Uh, I want you to kind of, you know, assimilate that. Think about that. This particular word, it, it does mean that. It means to hear verbal communication uh, that's heard, that's received with understanding. But this particular word, it has a prefix in the Greek And it's um, it's who pair. And this is a real interesting word. So the prefix in Greek, when you read it, it's a kue atas who pair. And when you put this together, this is the word in the English we get the word hyper from. So when Jesus starts to go into this parable, he looks at everybody. He doesn't say, hey, just listen to my verbal communication, receive what I'm saying, and get some knowledge up here. He is saying, you need to listen to this in a hyper way. You need to, there's hearing, and then there's hyper hearing. There's hearing from the ears, from the ear canals, verbal communication, and then there is hyper hearing. That is hearing that touches the heart, hearing that touches the soul. Hearing, watch this, it even goes further than this. This type of hyper hearing, a kue, is the hearing that affects the actions. Because everything that Jesus said was intended to produce righteous living, godly living. Uh, Jesus didn't just run around and say, hey, just listen to me, you know, write it down in a book, get some head knowledge and go live your own way. Everything that Jesus taught was intended to be hyper hearing, was intended to affect the actions of the people who listen. And that is that everything Jesus says, everything Jesus taught, everything Jesus told everybody, he intended it to change their lives so they would live it. And this is, to be honest with you, this is the difference between a religious person and a Christian. The difference between a religious person, a Pharisee, is someone who just has a kuo, has all the head knowledge, understands all the little bits and pieces about what's in the Bible, and the difference between the Pharisee and a Christian is a Christian actually lives out what he hears. That's what the book of James is all about, right? Don't tell me you're saved because you just got faith. You understand. No, no, no. We'll know that you're really saved by what? Your actions, your works. That's hyper hearing. And so that's something that, to be honest with you, the 20-some years I've studied Greek, I never saw that until last week. And the only reason why I saw it is because I was studying my Greek text, and this little, this, so it's hard to understand. So, so there's a mark right here over this U, which tells me what tense this is in. But right here on this A, there's another little mark. I didn't put it there, but that mark right there tells me that this word generates from a prefix. It's a whole different language, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in the original Greek, it just has this. It doesn't have that. It has this. So when you're studying it, you go to, you see this mark, and then you look up in your, in your Greek dictionary, and it tells you what the prefix is. Then you study the prefix, and we put the word together. 
it's pretty much translated hyper hearing. That's how it's translated. It's a beautiful word. And, and that's what Jesus is saying. This parable is so important to Jesus that he tells the people, you need to really hear what I'm saying. And that's why the parable is in three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He continues to say the same parable because he wants them to really, really get it. So I think this is a foundational parable just based off that one little tiny word. Um, I kind of want to go back to my pet peeve and the thing I always harp on. Um, the reason why I think this parable is so foundational because I think churches are constantly trying to uh, adopt all kind of bizarre and unbiblical means to try to get a desired response out of the people because they feel like their church services are flat and no one's responding. And that is dangerous. And that is really dangerous. Um, you know, when you're trying to get some synthetic or surface response from people in the church so other people in the church can see that, hey, uh, you might be successful in ministry, that is dangerous because you can create a sense of false assurance in people's hearts that they're saved because you have, a, you have, you have turned the message to adapt to the needs of the sinner versus allowing the Word of God to convict them in their hearts and then really change them the right way so everyone else can seem like, oh, the ministry is successful. How do you know that? Because everyone just went to the altar Sunday. No, no, no. That's not how you know a church is successful. And evangelicals, they adopt all these bizarre and unbiblical methodologies, if you will, to try to get people to respond. And guess what? Me... You and nobody on this face of this earth is ever going to get stony, rocky, weed-infested hearts to respond to the gospel. Only God can do it. So while we're putting, you know, coffee shops in churches and doing all these other bizarre things, and I get it, some intentions are good. And I'm not against those things. As long as the pulpit is preaching the Word of God and as long as the pulpit understands the reason why it's being done. But when you get churches who start adapting and changing and altering the message because they're not getting the desired response, well, guess what? Jesus preached for three years, and guess what? He didn't get the desired response all the time. Matter of fact, there was people trying to kill him. This is God in the flesh preaching. And you know what he was preaching to? A bunch of rocky, hard, weed-infested hearts. I mean, this is God himself. And so I think that we can't update the word. We can't update the message. We can't update the gospel. The issue has always been the soil. It has always been the issue. And so in verse 15, we'll kind of go through a little bit right here. But verse 15, we're just going to call this the wayside here. And if you look at verse 15, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, or the gospel is preached. But when they have heard it, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Uh, Luke chapter 8 verse 12 says that when they heard it, they didn't believe. So the way side here, we can interpret that as the hearer who is just someone who is just unresponsive to the gospel. An, an unbeliever who just doesn't care. They reject it. They don't want to hear it. Somehow, some way, maybe they come in contact with a family member or someone who witnessed to them and they just don't want to hear it. They don't want to be saved. They're not going to believe. And guess what? Satan creeps in and he takes that word out of their heart or he takes it before it even takes root. And, and that can mean many different things. That could mean, you know, many different ways that, that, that transpires. But at this particular wayside here, which would be that roadside path that the seed hit, that the surface was hard, the surface was cold, weren't able to break through that surface to get any good deep root, would be the unbelieving heart. And the unbelieving heart, one who is just totally averse to God, it's exposed to all kind of vices in the world. It just is. The unbelieving heart 
uh, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. He doesn't want to hear about God. doesn't want to hear about the gospel. He doesn't want to hear about anything. That type of heart is exposed to every vice in the world. It's exposed to every false religion in the world that makes him feel good about how he lives in an unmoral way. And that type of heart, guess what, is traversed over and over and over and over by evil things and wicked things and sinful things. And that type of heart is cold and callous. And that is a soil that is very, very hard. It's a wayside here. And Satan has his way with that type of heart. Has his way with that type of heart. Um, the second one is, we'll just call it the shallow here. And this is where I always pounce. And this is the reason why I do Verse 16, And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, look at this, immediately receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And you know what this picture's? It repictures the person who responds immediately to the word, but fizzles out. I, oh, there's one thing I want to backtrack and tell you that all of these soils outside of the soil that produces 30, 60, 100, these are all unsaved people. These are all lost people. Uh, there, there's no amount of, there's no loss of salvation in this parable. Uh, there's no, hey, someone got saved, they responded, and they fell away. No, no, all of these soils are unsaved hearts that never got to the finish line. And that's what this heart is, once again. This is that, that shallow heart. Um, we'll just call it a spurious conversion. We've seen it all the time. If you've grown up in church, you see it all the time. You know what you see? You see the pastor who gives the altar call. You see the people who run down to the altar. You see people get up or people down there with tears and they get up and guess what? They're glad. They're, they're joyful. Uh, they sign a little commitment card. They get hooked up into the church. And then the very next day, which would be a Monday, it's business as usual. No real change. No real conversion. But I saw him in church on Sunday. He was down at the altar. He talked to the pastor. He signed a commitment card. He had joy all over his face. But yeah, the very next day, guess what? He was doing the exact same thing he's been doing. No change. That, that's this heart right here. That's the shallow here that the next day is business as usual, that nothing really transpired. The initial response is joyful. The initial response is, hey, I'm saved. Guess what? The things in this life expose if that conversion is genuine. You know, there's a, I try to tell people this all the time, there's this temporary credence to the truth that really is not a hallmark of genuine saving faith. Just because you respond in a joyful way to the message of the gospel, that's not a mark of salvation because guess what? There's there's tons of unbelievers in this world that don't even care about the Bible or Christianity. And guess what? They are happy people. They are. Joy I've met tons of unbelievers who are joyful, who are happy, who are more po positive than Christians. So joy is not a, 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 an identifiable mark of someone who's really born again. You know what an identifiable mark of someone who's born again? Two of them. Their actions and their endurance in the faith. Their endurance, that's what this whole little part about is, guess what? The seed falls, it starts to poke through, looks like maybe it's going to produce some, some good fruit, but guess what? And have no root in themselves, and so endure what? But for a time. And that's where the loss of salvation people jump in, right? Oh, that's loss of salvation. No, 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 that's not loss of salvation. That is spurious, false conversion. This right here never produced any fruit. Notice that once again, that none of these seeds, none of these souls produce fruit except for the one who's born again. 
So there's never even any fruit on any of these. So when a loss of salvation guy says, that's lost salvation. She said he, he immediately received it with joy, said he endured before time. And yeah, but nowhere in here does it say he, he produced any fruit. So you're telling me a Christian can be a Christian without producing any fruit? Because last time I checked, the book of Galatians says that the fruit of the Spirit, it begins to tell all of the actions. You, you have to produce some of those in some slight way. I mean, that's what the book of Job is all about. Job endured to the end, didn't he? You want to know why he endured to the end? With everything taken away from him, he endured to the end because he was really born again. He was really changed. He was a real believer. The hallmark of a real Christian is that they endure to the end, and they don't endure in their own power, their own strength. They endure because they have the Spirit of God. They have the power of God that lives and resides in them. And so th this is... This is not authentic faith at all. This is just a spurious uh, conversion. This is the altar call. Come on down here. Get a little joy in your heart. And then guess what? Business is usually the very next day. Verse 18. The worldly hear. These are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You know, I... Between these two, I see them all the time. This, this worldly here, verse 18 and 19, this happens a lot when you get people that get invested into the church. They become a part of the church. They get to know the people in the church, but they have a secret life behind that. They have another, they have another life behind that going on, and it's usually they're intoxicated by stuff in the world. Whether it's money or fame or lust or, you know, th there's always that other life that people show you. And I've met a lot of people who just said, hey, you know, Pastor, I was in church for a couple years, but at the same time I was in church for a couple years, I was gambling heavy, hard. I was had gambling debts going on, and I was living a totally different way than I showed everybody on Sunday. And guess what? That's the, once again, that's the spurious conversion. That's the person who comes into the church, hears the words, excited about the word, gets, starts getting involved, but he has another life on the back end, and the other life on the back end where he's intoxicated with things in the world, those things choke out everything he hears on Sunday. You can't come in here Sunday, hear the word of God preached, uh, be a part of the fellowship, then come here on Wednesday, do Bible study, and the rest of the week you're intoxicated with the world. <laughs> it's not going to work. And, and that's the type of ground that Jesus was talking about. That's a weed-infested heart. Uh, that's a worldly hearer who's preoccupied with worldly things, intoxicated by the enticements of the world, that quest for everything in the world. And what that does is that just literally chokes the word, and then you become unfruitful. So every one of these soils, they're all unsaved hearts. They're all unsaved people, but the word, they have different, they have the same responses, but they're all in different conditions. Some are just outright unbelievers, so the word doesn't even get a second to take root. Some are spurious conversions that are actually in the church, that hear the word, that are part of the church. And guess what? Because it was a spurious, false conversion, not an authentic conversion, they fall away. They drift away. They don't come back. And then that third person is the person who's got that secret life, just intoxicated by the world. The only people in this parable who are actually truly born again and saved are the people who produce fruit. And that's verse 20. That is the fruitful hearer. And I'm going to tell you at this point, we've got to be real careful. Because this parable is not intended to teach that you yourself can change your own heart. And that's why it's real careful when you deal with parables. Because someone could step back and say, you know what? If the whole point about these parables is the issue of the heart, then that means the other three souls that we just talked about, their heart was evil, their heart was bad. But you know what? Verse 20, the reason why the seed took root in that person's heart because he's a righteous man, he's a good man. Maybe he was raised in a Christian home, right? I mean, that would kind of logically fit, correct? But that's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is not to show how people's hearts got to where they were, it's to show the condition of the hearts when they received the word. 
And now we know scripture is real clear that we can't change our own heart. That's not anything you can do. And here it is. That's why when people come into the church and they hear the word of God, there is no amount of checklist that the pastor can put up that would say on Sunday morning, if you're listening to me today and you want to have a heart that's prepared before I preach, you need to do this, 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 and that. And then guess what? When I preach, you're going to have a good heart and you're going to be able to receive the word. Because guess what? If it was just that easy, we put it up there so everyone could see it. It has nothing to do with the one who sows the word. It has everything to do with the soil. And the soil, watch this, can't change itself. It has to be the immediate and supernatural work of the Spirit of God working on the heart while the Word is being received and accepted. That's the only way. The soil isn't jumping up out of the ground saying, Hey, throw seed over here. Now, the soil in this parable is flat and dormant. Uh, the soil can't change itself. The soil can't change the ingredients in the heart. Only God can do that. So what, what makes the soil good? What makes the soil good is God and God alone. You know, there's one thing that I had to come in to grips with early on preaching, and, and that was um, that God is the only one that can change the human heart, and no matter no matter how many people respond to the way the word is preached, you have to just keep focus of God is the one who's in complete control. And then I sleep good at night knowing that. I sleep good at night knowing that I've done my duty, I, I, I've fulfilled my calling, that when I preach the word of God, no matter how many people don't get up or do get up, because I'm going to be honest with you, I've been in the prison systems, preaching in the prison system, where I've literally had to stop the service because half of the chapel came up to the altar. We didn't even have any space. I've been there, done it, seen it. And if, if you start thinking that's going to happen all the time, or if it doesn't happen, that means you were unsuccessful in the way you preached, then you'll start measuring yourself by every single service. And if you do that, you'll drive yourself nuts. And trust me, I'm already charismatic as it is and passionate when I preach. Oh, trust me, I can whip people up to get them to come down to an altar. You know those pastors, the last five minutes, they step down and hey, you got to be saved right now. If you don't come down this minute, the door's going to close, you're going to leave out, you're going to go straight to hell, and then just whip them up, whip them up, whip them up, whip them up. And get in there and turn them around a little psychology and make them feel guilty and shameful. Well, guess what? If the Spirit of God don't do that, you ain't going to be able to do it. Because that's the purpose of the Spirit of God is to convict. God is the only one that can turn and change the human heart. I want to give you one quick thing. My, well, maybe five minutes worth. Hmm. This brings us to a, a pretty. Uh, this brings us to a pretty serious conversation, and it's it's something that a lot of people don't think about if they don't really study theology. I'm just going to tell it to you here. So, this is kind of what defines what we call Reformed theology. And that is, in Reformed theology, we believe regeneration precedes faith. Not faith precedes regeneration. Regeneration just means to be born again, to be made new. So, this is the defining doctrine of Reformed theology. That we believe in the order of salvation, which is which is simultaneous. We call it the order of salvation because we can't peer into what's taking place the moment someone's born again at the very second. So in theology, we, we, we call this the order of salvation. What comes first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, or whatever, but it's all simultaneous act. And in Reformed theology, we believe that regeneration must take place first before someone saves, but yet it's all one continuous act. And the reason why we believe that is because the Bible over and over and over again says that everyone is spiritually dead. That all sinners, their understanding is darkened. That their hearts are evil. Romans 3, no one does good, no not one. No one seeks after God. 
Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is evil, desperately wicked, above all who can know. I mean, over and over, it, it's unequivocal from Genesis to Revelation that God describes the unregenerate heart as wicked and spiritually dead. Therefore, if you have a spiritually dead heart, how can a spiritually dead heart wake itself up? How can a dead person wake themselves up? There's no way. How can a dead heart bring life out of a dead heart? There's no way. Uh, everybody's heart outside of Christ is like dead Lazarus in the tomb. Uh, Lazarus didn't wake himself up. God had to wake Lazarus up in order for Lazarus to come out of the tomb, correct? And he called Lazarus by name. And the reason why is because if he probably wouldn't have said Lazarus, every other person in the tomb would have got up. So not only did Jesus call Lazarus by name, and then Jesus once again didn't, uh, Lazarus once again didn't come out of the tomb saying, Jesus, why would you wake me up from the dead? And guess what? Jesus didn't drag Lazarus to salvation. You know, you often hear with Reformed theology and Calvinism that we believe that, that God just twists people's free will and, and God makes people believe. Well, Jesus didn't make Lazarus believe. Jesus just called him and guess what? Life came and Lazarus came out willingly and was glad he was alive. Correct? That's exactly how salvation takes place. You can't resist if you're dead, right? You got a dead man there, you can kick him, punch him, shoot him, stab him. He's not going to move. He's dead. And so, spiritually, the sinner is dead. That's why this must take place first before someone believes. That's that heart right there, the soil that produces 30, 60, 100. It, it's not that that soil, that heart in Jesus is teaching, you know what, uh, this person just woke himself up and he just said, you know, he was listening to the gospel and preached, said, you know what, that sounds like a good thing, let me believe. No, 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 no. The Spirit of God is working in people's hearts way before they ever believe. In little increment ways and sometimes ways you don't even know. Like in my case, I was sitting in a county jail and this big old fella comes over to me and, and reads me the Bible. He had no clue God was already working on my heart before he even got to me. So in Reformed theology, we believe that God awakens the human heart and then God grants the gift of faith to that believer. And the believer is responsible to exercise saving faith, to understand the message, to absorb the message. But that is all one simultaneous act in one moment. Probably a millisecond. People who aren't reformed believe the opposite, which is preposterous. And that's the real nitty-gritty of the order of salvation. People who always attack Reformed theology, they believe the opposite. They believe you can exercise saving faith, but your heart's dead. <laughs> how, how, how can you... If that's the case, then every verse in the Bible says, like Ephesians chapter 2, that He awakens you to life, and Jesus talk, gives you... If that's the case, then why does God have to awaken you if you've already awakened yourself? So this right here, faith preceding regeneration, is crazy. Regeneration always precedes faith in the order of salutis, in the Latin and the order of salvation. Most of the church believes this. There's tons of people. Who, the people who believe lost salvation, they believe the opposite way. They believe you're the one that created your own life your spiritual life, you're the one that changes, you prepare your own heart, you prepare your own soil by doing whatever you do. And then guess what? You're the one that came to Christ on your own, and you're the one that can leave Christ on your own. Reformed theology believes that guess what? You didn't come to Christ on your own, Christ drew you to himself, and therefore you'll never walk away and go the opposite way. No matter how bad it gets, you will always be so that's a big difference. Let me close with this because I know that that probably sparked a whole other topic. But that's 30, 60, 100. And that's why nowhere in the parable does it talk about that whoever these people are, they plow their own hearts because that has to take place first. Yes, man has the responsibility to believe. But guess what? When God awakens the heart, they will believe. And that's where the election and all that stuff comes in there. But let me show you something. People always miss. Go to John chapter 3 for a minute. 
and we'll end right here because I, I go on a tangent on this because it's just it's just it's the Bible. No matter if people want to listen to it or not, it's there. If you're dead spiritually and you're buying to the truth, how in the world can you wake yourself up? Can't happen. Not gonna happen. And all through the Bible it says it actually says those Ephesians chapter two, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Dead means dead. We can't change that to say, oh, I'm just dead in one part but alive in another part. No. People outside of Christ are dead spiritually. And you know what? That's why the altar call doesn't work. Because God has to perform surgery in the heart first before the people can receive the word. And he does that once again simultaneously, momentarily, right in the middle. He can do it in the service. He can do it on the beach. He can do it anywhere he wants to do it. But when I'm throwing seed, when I'm preaching, guess what? That seed's falling on all different types of soils. It's falling on hard people. It's falling on stony people. It's falling on good people. You know, good ground. It's falling on all. And guess what? I'm not the one that can kind of manipulate and maneuver and create tactics to try to get the result that I want. God's the only one can do that. That's why the altar call is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. And that's why it's nowhere in the Bible, because that's not the way God doesn't connect salvation to an altar. God doesn't connect salvation to an event that the pastor creates. God connects salvation to the event of the cross and someone believing in that. But John chapter 3, watch, it's so plain, it's so plain sight, we, often, we miss it so much. Right here, John chapter 3, we know the story. Let me show, point out some words. There was a name, man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. A ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou do except God be with him. Stop right there. Here you have a very smart man, the smartest in the land. He's not only a Pharisee, he's actually, that little phrase, a ruler of the Jews, that word means teacher, didaskalos. He's actually the teacher in Israel. So he's not just a Pharisee, he's the teacher in Israel. He's like the president in Israel. And he's, what is he saying? He's giving Jesus props. He's saying, man, listen, I've been hearing about all the stuff you're doing. I'm receiving it. I'm absorbing it. That's why I'm coming to you by night. So once again, watch this. This is a dead man who's religious. He's dead spiritually, but he's still initiated coming to Jesus by night, right? So he's got knowledge of what Jesus is doing. He's going to come to Jesus. He thinks he's already a step above everybody else as far as spiritually. He thinks that because he He's heard everything Jesus is doing. He's kind of, you know, cognizantly said, you know, yeah, he's doing miracles. He's got to be sent from God. Let me go talk to him. He thinks he's one up on everybody else. And he really is not. He's in the same place everybody else is. Because look what he says in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot what? You know what that is? Notice the, 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 the wording. Unless you are born again, you can't what? See. What people outside reform theology do is they say you can see first and then you're born again. That's what people say. That people say you're sitting in the service and guess what? You're taking in the information of the gospel and then your free will kicks in and says, you know what? I see the cross. I believe That's not what Jesus just said. Jesus says you have to be regenerated first then you can see. Then, spiritually speaking, you're able to see. So that's the reverse order than what we're taught a lot in church, but it's right here. Notice Jesus doesn't even give in to the, oh, yeah, I've done miracles. and done. He just goes straight to being born again. You're religious. You need to know what everybody else I've been telling them. But that's not all. Watch this. This is interesting. Verse 4, Nicodemus says unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? And he entered the second time into his mother's womb and born. He's just so smart but so dumb. You see it? He, he, Jesus literally has to, has to help Nicodemus along because he can't get it. You want to know why he can't get it? Dead spiritually. How simple is that to understand? You come to Jesus, you're a Pharisee. You're the teacher of theology in your whole nation. 
You are the doctor of Old Testament theology. You have just come to Jesus, and Jesus says, listen, unless you are born again, you cannot see. And he can't put those two together. He can't get it. You want to know why? Because he's blind spiritually, he's dead spiritually, and no matter what motions and movements he's using in front of Jesus in the conversation, no matter if he's already acknowledged that Jesus does miracles, he still can't get it. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Just verily, verily, I said, except a man be born of water, and that has nothing to do with baptism. And of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I'll get on a tangent here. I'm just going to throw you a little... Throw you a little treasure right here. This has nothing to do with water. And you wonder why it has nothing to do with water? Because guess what? Jews don't believe in Christian baptism. Baptism wasn't even instituted. We're still in the Old Testament. This is still Old Testament theology. He's talking to a Pharisee. A Pharisee would have no idea of what Christian baptism is. A Jew's mind is in Old Testament theology. The, the, the gospel hasn't even been written yet when this is taking place. So the, the Church of Christ never, oh, this, this has nothing to do with water. We'll, we'll get to that one day. But anyway. <laughs> Verse 6. Here it is. That which is born of flesh is what? Flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. There, there's, the, there's the defining mark. What Jesus is saying is flesh can only produce flesh. Flesh can only produce flesh, and the spirit is what produces spirit. So he's once again he's telling Nicodemus, "You're dead. You, you, what I'm telling you, you cannot produce it. You can't fabricate it because you're flesh. And flesh, there's no way flesh can produce this. Only the spirit of God can." Watch this, verse seven. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Verse eight, most powerful passage Reformed theologians believe. The wind blows where it wills, and thou hears the sound thereof, but cannot tell from whence it comes and whether it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You know what that illustration was? You do not control your own salvation. He is standing probably in a field somewhere with Jesus at nighttime, and you know what Nicodemus is feeling in his pharisaical robe and his open feet sandals? He is feeling probably wind flowing past him and the air going through him. And Jesus picks up on that and he says, you know what? This is how real salvation works, Nicodemus. Just like this wind comes in when it wants to come in and it leaves when it wants to leave and no one can control the wind coming out, no one can control the wind leaving, so it is everyone who is born of the Spirit. He just took salvation right out of Nicodemus' hands and said, guess what, there's nothing you can perform in your own flesh that can save you. Well, you know what that would do? That would just stun me. I'd be like, well, Jesus, how in the world do I get saved? I'm going to show you the, the paradox and the sovereignty of God. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? He, you know, that's the only thing he really picked up. How hard it is to be saved. He didn't pick up nothing else but that. He's like, whoa, what's going on here? It's out of my control? Jesus answered and said unto him, Are you not a, I'll just use the word, Are you not a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Like Jesus is like, come on. You don't know this stuff. Like, this is elementary. Verse 11. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we've seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know that John 3.16 is not a proclamation of the gospel with Jesus and thousands of people? It's the proclamation of the gospel with Jesus and one person. And do you know why? Because Jesus just used this word right here. Because you know what Nicodemus' world is? The Jews. 
Nicodemus's whole theology, the whole structure of Nicodemus' theology is only the world of the Jews can be saved. The people that descended from David, the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people that God cut covenant with, the people that God made the priesthood. Do you know what? Jesus just shattered Nicodemus' entire theology with that one verse said, whosoever. Nicodemus doesn't even have a clue what's going on here because Jesus just said in verse 8 that salvation is out of your control. It is just like the wind coming in, the wind leaving. No one can control it, so it is who's born of the Spirit. You can't birth your own self into the Spirit. Flesh is flesh, Spirit is Spirit. And then Jesus comes right back to verse 16 and says, Guess what? Whosoever believes. So which one is it, Jesus? I mean, is it the sovereignty of God and salvation? Or is it the responsibility of man in salvation? And guess what? It's both. It's both. It's both. From heaven down, God is in complete control of our salvation. He is the one that must awaken the heart so we can believe. And from the world up, it's we believe, but God, yet God has already performed the work in the heart. That's what he's struggling with. And then so verse 16, that verse we love so much, is actually Jesus witnessing to Nicodemus. It's not a proclamation. I mean, we use it like that. But it makes it even more powerful because what Jesus has just done is he has just said, guess what, salvation, you are not in control of your own salvation. And guess what, you have always thought that your little world was just the Jews. And I'm telling you, the world means the world. If you study Nicodemus, Nicodemus got it at the end. Nicodemus became more again. I, I believe the scripture bears that out because you know what you see? You see in John chapter 7, he, you see he's kind of fighting for him. In John chapter 7, there's some lawyers there and they're trying to put Jesus away. And Nicodemus steps in and says, whoa, 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 whoa. we need to look at our law before we can kill anybody. And he's with his other people uh, trying to attack Jesus after he's been into the temple. And then what you see at the end of Nicodemus' life is, guess what? They've already uh, put spices on him and everything. And guess what? Jesus is in the very arms of Nicodemus. Nicodemus has the body of Jesus in his arms. He is identifying with Jesus at the end of his life. John chapter 19 and 20 and 21. So I think Nicodemus got it, definitely. But... That's a, um, let me give you one more verse. I'm going to shut up. I told you I was being here forever. <laughs> <laughs> let me give you the, 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 the two sides of the coin right here. John chapter 1. This is the both sides, the divine sovereignty of God and salvation and human responsibility. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. There, there it is, the responsibility of man to believe, correct? Verse 13, which were born, this is referring to spiritually, not humanly, which were born not of the blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but what? You see it. So verse 12, verse 12 is the responsibility of man to believe in God, but verse 13, John saying, well, guess what? It wasn't your will that did it. The will of man wasn't the will of the flesh. It wasn't anything inside of you that turned your heart to God. It was ultimately God that turned your heart to God. And verse 12 really actually gives you the whole just to it. It says, but, but as many as received him to what? Them he gave the power to become. There it is right there. That's this. God gives the power for the individual to become a child of God. It has to come from him because the dead sinner cannot awaken his dead heart. It's an oxymoron. Can't do it. So, that's the parable of the sower. <laughs> so I think that, um, I know I, I kind of went off on a tangent a little bit, but I think this is necessary because that parable is so you often have people asking about verse 20. Because in a way it does seem, if you kind of put it together, it seems like, hey, these were good hearts and these were bad hearts. And guess what? Because they had good hearts and the word of God was preached and 
they got good hearts. Maybe they live morally. Maybe they were raised in a Christian home or whatever, but they're not saved. And their hearts are just really good, and the, the Word got preached to them, and they accepted it right away. Well, that's antithetical to all the Bible ever teaches. It doesn't matter if you were raised in a Christian home or not. You still have a dead heart. You're still a sinner. You're still just as wicked and depraved as everybody else. Just on the outside, you look a little bit better. That's all. That's all it is. So we don't have the power in and inside of ourselves to change us. It's got to be God and God alone. And that's why this pastor can lay down at night and know that if God saves people, it'll be God's way and not my way. And that's why I don't get necessarily discouraged to the point of, of ministerial fatigue, which I know a lot of people have. I know pastor friends of mine that have quit because they feel like nothing's ever working, nothing's ever going their way. And when you start taking that approach to ministry, you have stripped God from his natural power. And his natural power is that he is the one that creates life in the human heart. He's the one that changes people. I've had people at Atlanta ask me several times, why don't you do an altar call? Why don't you give a chance for people to get saved? Do you hear what you just said? How can, I'm a man, I'm a mere man. How can I get people saved? I can't. And the minute I try to step into that role and play junior Holy Ghost and think that I somehow have the creative knack, whether the way I approach preaching the Word of God, to be able to get someone saved, I lost my mind. But you know how many preachers actually think that in their head? A lot of them. A lot of them. And that's why a lot of them take that those words out. They don't want to use the word sin. They don't want to use the word hell. They don't want to use words that are offensive to the human heart. Because God forbid God's word would cut people, convict people, expose people, and then they would get changed. They go the opposite way. They want to make them feel comfortable first. And then they think by that that the response will be, salvation and that's not how it works you got to be cut first before you can be healed with that let's uh, pray and uh, ask the Lord just to be with our church and just be with our um, time Lord we're just thankful to be here where two or three are gathered in your name there you are in the midst uh, we're thankful for what you're doing in our church and the hearts of the people Lord, there, there is often times where we are concerned and often times where maybe we, we think about the growth of our church. But Lord, you always just bring us back to just uh, your promises in Scripture and that, that our job is just to be faithful, to be faithful to the Word, to be faithful to loving people and presenting the Gospel in a way that's clear. And we know that you are the one that will do the work. And Lord, sometimes that work is, oh, well, it's always on your time. And we, we trust in that. We depend on your timing. We, we're so thankful that, that you've given us the, the financial means to be able to do upgrades in our church in, in ways that will um, channel the gospel to people that maybe don't come to our church. We, we ask that you would bless, Lord, our, our direction with live streaming. And uh, we pray that it, there would be an explosion on live streaming, the likes of which we've never seen in this church. Where, where people will just be able to just connect with our church in a way that they haven't before. Lord, that you would bring people here, Lord, people that could learn of you, people that would know of you, that you'd help us to be faithful as leaders and, and board members and people in your church that try to direct your church and make great decisions in your church. We ask that you would bless that time and we pray that that would be a smooth process of them uh, hooking everything up, getting everything working, we just we pray that it would be done in your honor and your glory. We pray that you would see our, our sincere intentions and our motives to, to try to grow your kingdom in a way that only you can grow. And we would just be a small part of it. Um, we thank you so much. We love you in Jesus' name.